Uh, thanks everyone for joining today. My name is Bilal. I'm one of the marketing managers at Data Science Dojo. I'm joined here by Min Ha Huang. He's a principal solution architect at Microsoft. He'll be going over webinar on casual behavioral modeling framework, discrete choice modeling of consumer demand. And um, yeah, I'll hand it over to him now. He can start. Okay, great. So thank you for inviting me for this webinar today. So the topic that I'm going to present is about causal behavioral modeling by using a framework called the discrete choice model of consumer behavior. So this is quite useful framework for demand modeling in general, but it can be used for any other context, as long as there are choices involved uh, with the process, right? So that's the uh, the model that I'm going to talk mostly about. So in terms of the agenda, so I'm going to introduce discrete choice model, the most simplest version, which is the static uh, discrete choice model, which is focusing on a single uh, time period at a time uh, in terms of the decision customers make. And we're going to uh, have a talk about a couple of extensions based on this, uh, the basic model. So one of the extension is that usually this choice model requires the individual level or household level data. But if you only have the aggregate sales summary, you can still apply this by using uh, the more advanced framework, which requires some simulation. So that we're going to uh, discuss about how to extend basic discrete choice model, which is at the individual level into the aggregate level data only cases. Also the another uh, extension of the model is actually applicable in the internet or search or advertising kind of context, right? So that's called sequential search model, which is actually relaxing the, one of the assumption about Consumers know about the older options available. Usually it's not, right? So if you only get to know some information by actually doing some costly search, that's the extension in the case. Also, if you go beyond single period focus, you can actually think about dependency over time. That's called as a dynamic choice kind of problem. This is actually also related to so-called sequential decision-making. So. This is actually an explainable version of the reinforcement learning. Also, finally, uh, there are recent ad ad advancements which allow to est estimate or produce mod discrete model in scale that require neural network representation of the discrete model. So I'm going to talk about this as well. So those are basically the five topics. As you can tell, you know, it's actually pretty big uh, content for a short amount of time. So I don't expect you to understand everything here. This is meant to be an introduction. So I'm gonna go through uh, what is available uh, in case you have certain problem which can be solved with this tool, right? Also, what other key references you can go to in case you wanna go deeper, right? So it will be a little bit of fire hose. So expect that that's the case. You don't have to understand everything here. But as long as you understand that uh, this is a certain uh, kind of tool with certain properties, and this can be useful for certain type of problem, that's basically what I want you to get out of this webinar today. So in terms of the brief background, this Kirchhoff model is actually created by the uh, one of the famous uh, economists, Daniel McFadden. He's called the father of this choice model. It's actually got Nobel Prize in 2000. And the first uh, commercial application of this model was actually trying to predict the Bay Area transit traffic volume uh, without any historical data. So they conducted some survey-based research, which is called as a choice-based kind of conjoint or CBC, and basically asking about how likely the people are going to choose BART over existing kind of other options like bus or bike or maybe walking to walk, right? And then made a prediction about what would be the expected market share for the bot. And they actually made pretty good prediction. So that was the first application. And after that, uh, essentially the tra transportation research and economics and marketing science picked this up as a main demand forecasting engine. So there are a lot of research in those three disciplines in general. And there are uh, most uh, recent advancements around those extensions I mentioned already. 
And also, if you uh, step back and think about the evolution of this model, it kind of evolved together with what data become available. Right? So initially, the focus for this model was with the customer panel data from so-called syndicated data providers. They basically collect data from the retailers like supermarket or the drugstores like CVS or the mass merchandisers like Walmart. So the initial focus was trying to predict the difference in consumer purchase behavior by using customer panel data. Later, it's extended to the aggregate sales uh, data at the store level. But with the internet become popular, they actually extended into the internet uh, consumer behavior such as clicks and browsing behaviors and also how they actually choose the search engine results as an example, right? So those are uh, basically types of data this can be applied. And in terms of the uh, question you can answer, so the main difference of this compared to the traditional machine learning model like XGBoost or the random forest is that you can actually explain stuff. So whenever there are requirements about explainability, it's actually better to have some uh, modeling technique which actually give you interpretable kind of uh, underlying construct, right? So that's where you know this model can be uh, helpful. Also, whenever the, your question called for the counterfactual analysis or what if types of scenarios, right? So if you do this kind of promotion, are we going to have more profit or not, right? So XG Boost is great for prediction in general, but it doesn't actually generate proper counterfactual simulation results, right? So if you have to do counterfactual simulation, it's actually better to use a technique which is actually based on causal theory and behavioral underpinning of the consumer behaviors, right? So that's the context where this can be useful. So in terms of the actual tangible applications, so there are a lot of uh, marketing science applications you can do. You can actually use this to measure price elasticity and then uh, do actually pricing after you build this model. Also for promotion event, you can actually uh, measure the promotion ROI by simulating the counterfactual scenario where you turn up your promotions, right? By comparing the actual data with promotion, the historical data with the counterfactual kind of prediction where you turn up promotion give you idea about how much of the incremental sales or profit you are generating from the promotion. So with the cost of the promotion, you can actually measure ROI, right? So also you can use this for new product kind of ideas. So the, I will explain more detail, but one of the ideas is that you are basically decomposing or the representing product as a bundle of attribute. With that, you can actually swap any of the attribute for the product and then create new product, which is never seen in the history, right? With that, you can actually create pretty good new product forecasting by for the resizing cases or new flavors or changing the brand or introducing new product under the same brand kind of scenario or maybe making healthy version of the uh, product, right? As long as there are other products which actually had this attribute before, this is actually allowing you to do a lot of new product kind of simulations, right? Also, this actually helps you to put the dollar value for the each attribute value. So with that, you can even create the model which measure brand equity or something intangible. So you can actually put the dollar value of you know, bigger size for certain segment, where you can actually quantify how much you people are willing to pay for the premium brand compared to store brand or standard brand, right? So those are major kind of applications, especially if you think about the traditional demand model where purchase or the actual transaction is the, the one you care about. For the internet kind of setting, it also, as long as there are choice phenomena, if the consumer are making certain choices, you can actually apply this model. So you can apply this to uh, click kind of predictions or actual conversion uh, in the website for the final sales or whether to visit certain website, that's kind of choice problem, right? Also, which page to go and next, like page navigations. So you can actually use this to study how consumers doing the browsing over the internet and also search over the internet, how they click, right? So it can be quite useful for advertising related or the recommendation related application too. 
So those are the what where this can be used and the little bit history about the model. Let's go to the actual technical detail about the modeling framework, right? So in terms of the where you can actually play with this, so let me just you know, point out that you know before it was really difficult. You actually have to take PhD level seminar from the select discipline to really get started with this. But with the open source, now it's become much easier to do this with the open source. So there are now pretty good Python or R packages, which is written here. You can get started with. And also the TensorFlow actually allows to develop custom model as long as the underlying contract can be described as a probability or the uh, overall graph. So with that, you can also do uh, implement this at scale by using the TensorFlow. So those are all possible kind of way of doing implementation. Also for large implementations, so certain internet companies like LinkedIn or Citrix started to use the large scalable distributed version of this model, especially when there are only binary choice, or either you know, buy or not buy or click or not click kind of scenario. Right? So they actually uh, open sourced uh, some packages like GDMX or Diamond. So those are one example about where this kind of modeling framework can be useful to make scalable decision on the internal level. Right? So in terms of the main construct, so there are a couple of assumptions we are making to actually allow that you can make some uh, good uh, prediction or inference based on the limited data, usually you not. Know, as you know, data is limited. You have to actually marry that with some theory or assumption to really make sense of the data, right? So one of the assumptions we are uh, making is the decomposition approach. So for each product, instead of actually estimating product effect by product by product, we are basically assuming that there are some important attribute and product can be represented by the bundle of the attribute, right? So this actually essentially do dimension reduction. So instead of estimating thousand parameter for thousand product, you can actually get down to maybe five key attribute, which may have a couple of levels, right? With the, this may help you to really reduce the dimension a lot, right? So as an example, if you are talking about display at clicking kind of model, the size of the advertisement, like small, medium, large, or the concept, maybe there are four different concepts. Those can be estimated easily instead of actually estimating the different ad effect for each different ad types, right? So those are the one construct, the product as a bundle of attribute. And also the second uh, kind of key construct is so-called heterogeneity, right? In marketing 101, we, everyone knows that consumers are users are very different in terms of what they like. So in this modeling framework, it actually allows to incorporate the difference in consumer behavior, or either assuming some groups, which is called discrete heterogeneity or latent segment or latent class, or assuming some continuous distribution like normal distribution. In that case, it's called as hierarchical base or random question, right? So usually this estimation can be hap happening through the Bayesian kind of framework, or you can use the maximum likelihood with some mixed effect kind of specification to estimate the group level or the individual level heterogeneity for certain aspect. And in terms of the theoretical kind of framework, essentially we are assuming the utility maximization. So we specify latent kind of function called utility, which you can think as a liking. So for each individual, when they have choice of the from the set of product J, and they basically evaluate the overall liking or usually they get from this product, which is basically a function of the underlying attribute together with some marketing like promotion and pricing, right? So with that, they basically make weighted liking score for each product. And based on some assumption about what are the unobserved error, right? Then you can actually create or equation which actually generate the probability of choice for each uh, product in the set, right? So that's basically underlying theoretical framework. And some mathematical derivation basically shows that if you are some certain structure for the error, sometimes you can even get the close kind of expression in terms of logic. And if you have the probit, you know, it's gonna be more complex numerical evaluation you need to do, right? 
So with that, basically you can actually starting from this uh, attribute and then price and the promotion and then go to the actual market share. So this next page kind of shows the one more detail about those, right? So in terms of data, you can actually you know, use multiple different data. So in, in terms of the primary research data, there are specific types of research, which is called as a choice-based conjoint. So with the survey data, you can do this, especially when there are no historical data, this is highly useful. Or you can actually use actual transactional data from for CPG com, uh, company consumer package good, like you know, Cola or the cereal as an example. Well, for retail, the supermarket tends to collect the royalty card data, right? So you can use those to actually create this model. For internet setting, you can use the web log or clickstream data to empower this model as well, right? So as I mentioned before, you basically need to define, also need to understand what are the key buying factor or attribute for each product. So as an example, if it's cola, maybe you can see that brand and taste, like the flavor and then calorie level or caffeine and size of a pack, like two liter bottle or you know, six pack of the uh, 12 ounce bottle or can or container type, like can or bottle, maybe the most important dimensions. With that, you can actually define product with those attributes, right? But you have to define the product. So you actually need additional data about the product attribute, right? And with that, you can basically specify the consumer utility. So here I use the cola as an example again, right? So there will be a parameter for the uh, base level demand and then taste, calorie and caffeine, pack size, and maybe container and brand. And also you can actually have the marketing sensitivity, like the sensitivity to the display at the end of the aisle display or the some feature at together with price, right? So that kind of specify your liking with added error. Then you can actually calculate the probability of choosing this uh, option out of the all the possible choices. So, th so that probability will be actually specified this mathematical equation here. If you are assuming that the your error is following the Gumbel distribution, right? So that's basically the formula you can use to actually calibrate your uh, with the data. So essentially you have prediction about your probability of choice for each option. In reality, you are only uh, choose, uh, show, uh, getting the data for one. Each consumer will choose one product out of the case choices, right? So basically you can actually fit this probability prediction with the actual choices and then uh, maximize the likelihood of the data based on your model, right? That's basically how you estimate these parameters. Also, if you are familiar with the deep learning, this uh, function here is actually called the softmax in the deep learning, especially for you know multi-class classification model like the computer vision. But uh, it, uh, in the econometrics, they call it as a multi-level logic. It's basically the same thing. But in the product context, one kind of tweak people do is that this choice set can change over the transactions, right? So with that, you can actually put availability indicator which turn it on and off uh, when product is kicked out from the certain week or a certain store, right? So that's an additional tweak you can uh, make to accommodate the varying choice set or the entry and exit of the product over time. So that's basically the basic framework. I already mentioned about the uh, heterogeneity of it, right? So there are two ways, major ways to do it. You can essentially assume that there are groups of consumers, but maybe a certain number of segments, like three or five, as an example, and then actually estimate this parameter at the group level. That's called a discrete uh, heterogeneity or latent class or latent segment. So this is actually also doable. Or you can, the simplest thing is homogeneous. Obviously, that's simplest, but you know, it doesn't actually uh, fit well with the data. So it, it's a basically uh, kind of uh, tested as a, you know, not really or feeling the data well already, right? Or well, continuous uh, representation where you actually assume some distribution about the individual level parameters. So instead of uh, estimating the, uh, the one parameter for each individual, you actually estimate distribution, right? So that's a trick. The pulling information across the customers help you to actually get the reasonable heterogeneity without actually saturating the model with too many, too many parameters, right? So that's the Bayesian trick. So 
that with that, you know, you can actually have pretty flexible model which allow difference in across uh, consumers, but you can actually uh, uh, explain the agri market behavior based on the individual consumer level utilities, right? So after you build this model, that, that's actually where the fund actually get, can start it. So you can actually utilize this utility model to create the market simulator where you can change pretty much anything. So you can specify or change the price, or you can also change the product attribute, which basically define your product specification. And after you define what other other products will be in the market, and once you combine this with your estimated utility parameter, which is the weight in the deep learning as an example. So basically that's what you estimate at the end. You can actually create the market share for different product or pricing or promotion scenarios and combine the cost. You can actually calculate profit and then you can actually do a lot of simulations or scenario analysis to figure out what other you know, profit maximizing price changes or promotions or the product changes, right? So I listed out you know, what are the actual commercial implementation based on this. So as an example, Marriott actually used this kind of technique to design their courtyard, right? Also HP do a lot of this conjoint based survey to actually do pricing of their printers, right? Also uh, as a recent example, Stitchfix also do use binary version of this model to do style recommendations. So that's the basic model. So let me actually kind of glimpse through the, what other extensions we can do based on this base model. So to recap, the base starting model is actually at the individual level data. So it, uh, so you have to have individual level data, but many times they, they may not be available except for certain contexts like you know, retailer with the royalty card data or CPG company who can buy something from the ILI or Nielsen, right? So if you only have the aggregate sales data, initially, you know, people thought that that's not possible to do this model. But later they realized that once you assume certain kind of the parameter distribution, you can actually simulate each pseudo individuals and then actually sum them up and then create some prediction, which is the aggregation of simulation. And then you can match this with the sales data. So that's basically the aha moment they had. So one, uh, they created the aggregate version of this model uh, for the case, you only have the aggregate sales data only, right? So essentially what you need is basically for each market and time period, you need to get the market share for each product, right? So that's your dependent variable. And you have the individual level consumer level model with the certain assumption about the distribution. And from which you can actually make the aggregated uh, kind of predictions, which can be matched with the market share which is change across time and across the market, right? So that's basically how you get the data and also you know, to match that with the predictions. With that, actually this allow you to uh, estimate this model even though you don't have individual level data, right? So if you go to a certain kind of uh, previous slide, they have a lot of details on this. So I'm not going to go through this technical detail uh, uh, here, right? But just give you intuition Essentially, you know, probability from the choice is can be a same to the market share, right? So in, in terms of the homogeneous kind of uh, case, basically you're summing across multiple users, then the market share is same to the probability of choice, right? So once you have this, the market share prediction, you can compare with the aggregate level market share. So that it will be your final kind of uh, matching equation. With that, you can actually estimate those parameters with the maximum likelihood or the method of moment kind of uh, techniques, right? So that's kind of simplest kind of case, right? Um, but if you have more uh, uh, realistic kind of scenario where you have the heterogeneity, things are getting more complicated, then you actually need a simulation technique, right? So that's basically what you need. But uh, there are one practical tweak. So if you only do homogeneous logic, you know, if you do out of sample validation with this uh, really simple model, usually the mid or the mean absolute percentage error is about 30 to 50%. But if you allow the price sensitivity parameter to change by product, actually you can reduce down to pretty good you know, uh, prediction like five to 15%. So that's kind of practical tweak, but it's not you know uh, based on the some 
a sound theory. So this is more practical hack. But the, if you wanna be more consistent with the underlying theoretical framework, then you have to uh, basically assume some heterogeneity structure for those parameters at the individual level, and then do simulation, and then do some aggregation of the simulated result to match with the data. So that's called the so-called BLP model or random question aggregate logic. So it, this was introduced in back in 1995 by three economists, uh, Barry, Levinson, Pickers. After that, uh, become quite uh, uh, utilized by a lot of applied researchers in marketing science and transportation research and also in economics. So now it, uh, the good thing is that it's actually available through the open source. So there are packages called PyBLP. So if you wanna play this with, uh, with this, with the aggregate level data, then PyBLP could be a good option. So that's basically the first extension on when you only have the aggregate level sales data. Another extension uh, which happened was that in the choice model basic setting, you are assuming that uh, Consumer actually know all the attribute and the, all the information about all the product which is available, which is you know pretty strong assumption, right? <laughs> Here we are uh, basically relaxing the assumption. So instead of assuming that they know all those attribute, uh, we are uh, saying that uh, they know partial information. So whenever they are trying to collect the information, they have to pay some such cost. With that, you can actually make so-called so sequential search model. Uh, uh, which is different from the starting model. So I'm gonna just go with the intuition. So essentially we have same utility framework, which basically again, consider making utility maximization choice, but they don't have all the information, right? So they have incurred some such cost to actually check out the, what are the other product. So they basically do stopping so uh, by following this rule. So for each remaining set, there are some expected marginal benefit from the picking one more product from the set. And there are marginal search costs. So to continue to search uh, when the ex expected marginal benefit is larger than the search cost and stop when there is no, uh, this condition is violated, right? So with that, you can actually build the econometric model or the causal model and then uh, compare this with the actual pre uh, data and then estimate this search cost together with these parameters, right? So that's uh, quite useful in the online setting where you actually have the trace of the search histories. You can even do this at the aggregate level as long as you have the uh, summary about the relationship between the product. Like the, if you remember Amazon before, they actually have the consumer who view this also view this kind of summary with the ranking, right? That ranking summary is enough to actually ask this model. Or you can actually, if you have the individual level data, that's also easier, right? So that's one extension for internet setting when consumers sequentially searching different information and then make a purchase, right? So that's, I would say, you no know, more realistic model. Let me check the chat window to see whether there is any questions. Okay, maybe not. Ah, okay, well, any reason for the linear kind of model for the utility specification? So just first thing to point out is that this model is actually non-linear because the actual, the kernel, which is the softmax, right? is non-linear, right? It's just that for the utility, you can actually use the linear kind of combination to derive the latent value. I mean, you don't need to do linear, but right. But uh, assume, uh, but if you don't expect that major drivers do not interact to each other, the main effect of only linear combo is a good start, right? But if you suspect that there are interaction between the attribute, then you can actually extend this model by increasing the attribute, uh, the interactions, right? Also, now there are some kind of trial to use more tree-based model instead of the linear combo in the utility specification. But when you are losing, it's more clear, you know, with the linear combo, there are clear weight, which is easier to quantify for attribution, right? But with the tree based model, it gets more complicated. So you may, might have to do, apply something like sharp framework, right? So that's kind of the price to pay. If you go from the linear utility specification to something more flexible, right? But it's 
you know, it's possible to apply more flexible specification if you want. Another extension that you can do is so-called dynamic discrete model. This is actually a explainable version of the reinforcement learning. So you can actually use the similar kind of framework, the utility, right? So, but uh, if you think about utility as a reward, right? That it's actually quite similar to reinforced learning. So you can actually use the explainable version of this framework for the reinforced learning as well, right? So for the, uh, those who are less familiar with the reinforced learning, uh, uh, this is actually, uh, you can think about uh, four different types of problems in the so-called prescriptive data science or when you want to make a recommendation about what to do. So you, the one dimension would be the time, right? So the whether the problem can actually give solve uh, period by period that's called a static kind of problem where the, when there is no dependency across times, right? But some problem has, is actually dynamic in nature, meaning that the future period may actually affect the current period uh, actions or the state, right? So that's called the dynamic problems. Also, it, it's deeper by the number of agents. The simplest setting would be, you know, there are only single agent, so one player kind of uh, setting that's much easier to structure and solve, but there are cases that there are multiple agents, more than one players, right? So this is most complicated because you now have to think about the game theory or, uh, or the interaction between the agents, right? So I'm gonna just focus on the most simplest setting, but where, you know, single agent, there are actually dynamic kind of uh, problem or sequential decision making. As an example, if you think about durable demand, right, the pricing as of now uh, might be high, but in the early uh, period of the product life, but the peop, uh, consumers expect that it's going to go down because usually technology companies introduce some pro durable product high price, but they tend to drop down the price quite uh, fast, right? So then uh, those who are less willing to pay high price can actually decide to wait because that they know that the future price will go down, right? So the future price or future period output is actually uh, affecting my choice in the current period, right? So in that sense, it's dynamic pricing problem, right? So that in the case, you have to have used the dynamic version of the model rather than the static version we just discussed, right? So for the dynamic version of the model, the key kind of technique you can utilize is so-called dynamic programming in operation research and economics, together with Markovian decision process, which is basically specifying how many period of the historical data is relevant for the current state or current environment, right? Also, there are some kind of uh, construct or the theoretical concept you need to get uh, know to specify this problem fully. So usually for this kind of setting, you have specifying so-called state variable which is the older important kind of, it can be latent or it can be observed data, but what is required to actually characterize the current environment of the problem. Also there are policies or actions that uh, you just, uh, or the agent can take. So those are basically what you care about, right? Also there are so, uh, transition function or Markovian prob probability distribution, which specify how current state uh, transition to some other state in the future, right? So those are based, uh, coming from the Markovian decision process kind of uh, assumptions. Also there are so-called value function and reward function. So in the simple static case, it is, you can think this as a utility, but if you have the continue, uh, also the future matters, then you have to actually sum them up across multiple periods, right? Then you have some discount factor and you have to actually use the discount factor and sum them up across multiple periods with, uh, for single period utility. And those are called as a value function or the other function in general. Also, you have to decide on whether only finite horizon matter for the current problem or whether the infinite horizon matters for the current problem, right? So with that, you can actually construct the reinforced learning algorithm and then solve this. And dynamic discrete model is basically a uh, single agent version of the reinforced learning essentially, right? So this is also uh, uh, applicable when the future period affect current decisions, right? So whenever your problem is uh, calling for that kind of structure, 
then you have to use the dynamic version of the discretion model rather than static version. So final extension I'm gonna discuss a little bit is the neural network uh, representation of discretious model. So this discretious model, because of heterogeneity is computationally quite intensive. So it's actually quite difficult to estimate this model with large number of users. So it's okay to maybe estimate this model with 500 or 5,000 users, maybe 10,000 you can do with reasonable cloud like AWS you know, with the large virtual machine. But if you go beyond, you know, 100,000 or a million, it become problematic, right? But now the recent advance with the deep learning, especially in a stochastic gradient descent or the distributed learning kind of framework can be applied here as well. As long as, you know, you actually represent this model in the relevant kind of graph framework or the neural network framework, then you can actually really scale this up, right? So that's pretty recent kind of discovery. So this is actually the neural network representation of the choice model, the basic static version. So for each product, you can actually uh, design the input layer, which is the uh, by attribute values, right? So you can actually create the bunch of the categorical dummy variable, which capture brand or the uh, diet regular flavor or the container type and, the, and also size of the package, two little bottle or 12 ones, 12 pack. So that will be your input layer. Uh, you can cluster them by the product, right? And then there are some common weighting factor, the liking weight, which will be shared across the product because we are assuming that same weight can be applied for the same attribute levels, right? If you combo this, you can actually get the overall utility uh, for each product. So this is will be utility layer. With that, if you apply the softmax activation layer, you can actually get overall cross entropy loss by comparing the software prediction for the pre uh, probability with the actual choice of the each consumer, right? So as long as you represent this this way, you can actually utilize the TensorFlow or Keras implementation of the uh, deep learning model to actually learn this in scale, right? So stochastic rent is decent or this distributed kind of learning framework can be useful to really speed up this computation and also scale this with the larger data set. So that's one pretty recent kind of the enhancement. So now it can be quite scalable with, even with the large size data. And also that is now can be estimated in reasonable time that waiting for you know, a couple of days or weeks, for example. Right? So those are basically the four extensions of the basic model, which has been evolved over the past 10 years. And if you are curious about going deeper in each dimension, I basically listed out some books or the survey articles or the open source package link here. So you can utilize this as a initial guide to go deeper on each topic. So let me stop here for the presentations. Any question you have? Okay. We do have a question from uh, Percy. Any reason why you're assuming a linear model here? Yeah, I think I handled this already. So linear model, so the, the model itself is nonlinear, right? It's actually softmax based kind of kernel, right? But we are assuming linear, uh, combo for the utility itself. So this is okay as long as you are expecting that each attribute do not interact with each other, right? So if, if you only expect that there are only main contribution for each, each attribute, which doesn't interact with each other, this is good assumption, right? But if you suspect that there are, can be interaction between the attribute, then you can actually relax the linear kind of specification and add more complex specification. So there's nothing wrong about that. You can either you know, uh, apply many interactions if you keep the linear specification, or you can even try tree-based structure or deep learning-based structure for the UCD itself. So there, so there is actually new research in LiDAR, which basically try to make this more automated and flexible by marrying the machine learning together with this framework but still you know, maintaining the interpretability. So that's kind of the requirement. 
Uh, I believe someone Amin wants to ask something. Yes. Yes. Hello. Thank you very much for your great talk. Um, I have a quick question. Uh, I was wondering if you have considered using Poisson trick to make the multinomial likelihood uh, a Poisson and then solve the problem that way, uh, which is so Poisson is an easier uh, distribution to deal with. Uh, yeah, great observation. Actually, Poisson is used for different kind of uh, setting, right? So Poisson is great for visit decisions, right? So if it's more about the how many times consumers visit the store, there are actually so-called yeah. negative binomial uh, model. So basically you are marrying the Poisson distribution with the gamma heterogeneity. That yeah. actually fit uh, the visit data pretty well. But in yeah. this context, it's actually not for count, right? So in this setting, the variable is count variable and Poisson is good uh, model for that. But if you are uh, talking about choosing one out of K options, right? Multinomial yeah. is the best way to go. No, I, yeah, I understand time. that. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. No, there, there is a three Poisson trick that, that you can use multinomial. You can turn multinomial as a Poisson. I, I just sent a paper. You can uh, look into it if you want. And then you can deal with the multinomial problem uh, easier. So it's possible. It's called Poisson trick. You can search for it if you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. Yeah, that sounds interesting. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Any oh, other we have one more question from Percy? So uh, okay. it says uh, so the attributes could be, could be function in themselves. Can you please answer them? Yeah, uh, sure. So, so this is actually interesting domain. So. So there are no restriction about the attribute as long as you know that's interpretable. No, that's the requirement, right? So. Uh, in the base version of models, if you want to maintain interpretability or explainability, it's better to use the data to define the attribute, right? But if you don't have that luxury about the having separate product attribute file, one thing you can potentially do is using the product description text, right? To a small NLP model, and you can create the embedding, right? And then using the latent embedding to actually drive the model, that's doable. Right. Also, that helps to capture the relationship between product. Right. But in that case, one thing you ha have to do is actually how to put labels for the embeddings. Right. So, what is the meaning of this embedding? Right. So, as long as you can put the clear label for the embedding, so that can be additional kind of extension you can do, kind of combining the product structure from the NLP for the attribute finding kind of automating this, right? And then uh, using, mapping that model together with this framework, right? If you extend even further, you know, you can actually maybe just grab Amazon consumer reviews and you don't have any hypothesis for the attribute, right? But you can actually do latent topping model on top uh, by after maybe part of speech tagging that will help you to identify what are the key attribute, right? And once you have that, maybe that can be a pipeline uh, for the second stage model, which is this kind of model. And then go in as a, you know, the topics from the model can go as an attribute, right? In that case, no, the topic will be a functional output from the previous model, right? That's doable too. Uh, hello? Okay. Hello? Yeah, yes, I can hear you. Start, Percy, you can oh, ask. oh, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, a great topic. Sorry, I just want to give context uh, to my question. You see, utility in an economic sense is, you know, is, is, is actually not a linear uh, function, right? Now, I, I, they, there's something that you say, James, is very interesting. Uh, I, I don't have the, I don't have the code or the, the model that you're running on, but it's quadratic. Uh, it's actually quadratic in its, in its form. Right. Now, what I was asking there is if, if, if you assume it's a linear, which I think is fine, um, <laughs> you gave an example, the last example, I think, which you were talking about, uh, you know, you separate, uh, uh, 
you said cola, Pepsi Cola. Yeah, this one. You had very, yeah, yeah, you had very, yeah. Now oh, that's good. So you gave very interesting district. Now I think I just got lost here because I, if these these are very good discrete attributes. If you use, if you use continuous, if you use a continuous model here, invariably you are going to have cola, Pepsi Cola, not necessarily be discrete. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, yeah that, that's the reason. Why. Actually, that's a good point. Well, that's one of the reasons the linear combo is okay because a lot of times, yeah. except the price, you know, basically you are having the categorical dominance, right? So it looks linear, but in reality, it's highly, highly flexible function. We don't yeah. actually assume anything, right? It's actually non parametric almost, right? So, yeah. so that's the reason why the linear works pretty well. It's essentially non parametric function to begin it, right? Yeah. But, but it breaks down when you actually uh, suspect the interaction between the attributes, right? As an example, yeah. the regular is more favored for cola. I was, yeah, I was, going, to, I was going to say that. So it, yeah. if, if we were going to, if, if you were going to show me your mathematical formula, regular, for example, is going to be probably a very low uh, uh, variable. It's going to have a very low uh, It's yeah, going but, to have a a, yeah, a, but a yeah, big. yeah. But actually, let me also point out that this is not actually one single parameter. Right? I kind of put the simple button here. Sorry, so sorry, have, sorry, sorry. It's got so you're saying regular co, uh, regular is going to mm -hmm. have a very low coefficient. No, no. Maybe what I a, what I'm trying to yeah. clarify is that in the uh, real model, this yeah. beta changed by the consumers. Some people like regular a lot. Some people like dislike regular. Yeah. You know? So it will be have distribution. <laughs> That's yeah. actually my, uh, that's the key thing about this model. Instead of having okay, one okay. parameter, you actually uh, estimate distributions across yeah. the consumers. Right? So no, the, no, no, there no, will no, be no. a different segment of consumers. Someone may like the regular, but some yeah. segments will like diet, right? That's the reason why you know, yeah, some, yeah. they sit in a market shares, right? Yeah, uh, I don't want to sidetrack you of your very impressive talk. Maybe I'll, I'll take this up on email or something because I, I, I'm, very, I'm very interested to see I would assume regular is going to have a higher, you know, if, if it's only two forms, regular diet, the coefficient for regular is always going to be almost invariably always high in, 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 in your modeling. No, Which it's we, not. Let, let oh. me take, let me take one, okay. you know, simple example, right? So one customer, yeah. you know, in the historical data, he always bought diet, diet. Right? Then his coefficient for diet will be super high compared to regular, right? But the yeah. other consumer always purchase regular, maybe only one time for diet. And he's actually, the regular coefficient will be super high compared to diet, right? So this is how you actually estimate heterogeneity. The previous purchase histories give you idea about what they like in terms of the- and, but, but, and, look, right? my, So, okay, no, I, I, I'm with you. That's, so when I ask, so the attributes could be functions in themselves. So you're saying to me the attribute, of regular or diet in that form will be a binary function. It, it, that's what it means. It, it will either be an either or. You know, you can't have someone who takes regular. Put it yeah. So to term. to be precise, yeah. you know, here the beta, right? Yeah. Is actually at an individual level, right? So that's a trick. So you don't have one question for calorie. You have as much as coefficient for HEA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Calorie, calorie will be continuous variable. I, I yeah. get that. Uh, taste, uh, uh, feature, some of those are binary at some point. But uh, yeah, that's why I, said. I don't want to sidetrack you what you're saying, but uh, I'll drop you an email or something because I'm just interested to see the actual, uh, if you run this off, say, the Coca-Cola, Pepsi thing, I just want to see the, 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 the data, what it says, if it's actually consistent. Yeah, and actually, it pretty pretty well, and you can actually buy a, a big diet segment, big regular segment. There are Coke Royal, there okay. are Pepsi Royal, you know, kind of what okay. you expect from the you know the oh. intuition, right? That's like showing up even with the data. And Thanks very much, man. It's great stuff. Thank you. Okay, cool. Any other questions? If anyone else has a question, you can unmute yourself and ask live or posted in the comment section. I think that's uh, that's all. Okay, great. Thank you so much for listening.
and have thank a great so day. Thank you for the talk. It was uh, very engaging. And thank you everyone for joining and interacting with us. We do have webinars coming up this month and also next year. So if you want to check out an RSVP for our upcoming webinars, I'll post a link in the chat. Yeah, you guys can go on RSVP here. We will be posting a recording of this session on our YouTube channel, as well as you'll get an email alert once we have the recording available. And make sure to follow us on YouTube, subscribe, and you'll also see the recording on our events page. Thank you everyone for joining. I hope everyone has a great rest of the day.